that you weren't so athletic, but somehow someone saw in you tremendous potential. And they pulled you and they said, you should work on some stuff because I want you to be on an Olympic team. Now think about any sport that you would prefer, whatever sport that may be, volleyball, uh, canoeing, I don't know, whatever they do in the Olympics. They, they saw that in you. You, we're going to pull you out of the life you had, and we see so much potential. You could go to the Olympics and be a part of this, and you're so overjoyed, and the Olympics are coming in a year, and then you spent that year just sitting on your couch or distracted, hanging out with your friends, and, and you never did anything to prepare or try to take your potential and get ready for the Olympics. And so the Olympics come and you sit there and you say, well, I didn't really do anything to get ready for this. And the one who pulled you aside would say, what? I saw so much potential. Why didn't you work at it? Why didn't you invest in this just a little bit? Now, some of this may happen in our Christian walk. See, Jesus sees us as people with potential. He pulls us into his kingdom, says, you are my child, and then we know that Jesus will return, and we have a life to invest in building up the kingdom of God, being a part of the body of Christ, and what if Jesus came back and we'd say, well, I didn't really do much at all. I just kind of hung out. I watched a lot of TV. I I don't know. I, I wasn't ready, and Jesus would say, what? I saved you for for this, my return, that we would be together forever. So in our Christian walk, we don't want to have that tension of not being ready, of not being invested in what God is doing. We want to go in ready for Jesus to return, having fully lived our lives as part of the kingdom of God, investing, uh, ready for that moment when Jesus comes back. Now, in our passage today, we are going to look at different things that God has revealed to us. One of them being that God is revealing that Jesus will come back a second time. Um, I want to throw up a slide here, if Heather's prepared for it. It should be the next slide. Now, I I won't do this with every John passage, but there's some passages where he is a very interesting writer, and he's throwing around all sorts of staccato ideas, but... Reading through the Greek, you start to see he keeps using the same words. And in this text in particular, he keeps using the word uh, for make known or reveal or have something appear. John is conveying in our Christian walk, there are things that are being revealed to us, are being made known to us that are appearing all the time. Some already happened, some will happen in the future And we get to be right in the middle of it, a part of it, swept up into all God is revealing. See, God is a great revealer. God could maybe be shrouded in mystery and uh, we'd know he's there but not really do much else. But God chooses to reveal and make known his plans, his purposes. That's why we have the scripture. Because God clearly wants to say, I want to reveal all I'm doing for my children in Jesus Christ. Now, in this text, we first see something that was made known to us or revealed that already happened. For us, it would be some 2,000 years ago. John is pointing out to us, hey, our Christian walk is wrapped up in an event that was revealed to us when Jesus came to earth. And this is vital. This is what God wants us to to remember and be a part in, that Jesus was here. Now, why was Jesus here? Why was he revealed to us as a baby that grew into a man? What was the purpose? Well, John tells us. Well, let's go to um, verse, or chapter 3, verse 5, and he says this. We know that he appeared so that he would take away our sins. The, one of the things that's revealed to us is that Jesus already came, And his purpose was to take away our sins. Jesus took on himself the sin of us, of the world, put it on himself, became perfect sacrifice in that, and then died, paying the penalty for all the weight of that sin. 
And then when God looks at us, his children, God says, hey, I see Jesus in you. And Jesus already paid the price for this sin. You, my children, are forgiven. So God is revealing stuff to us wrapped up in Jesus that is incredible for us, that is a gift. God is saying, I sent Jesus so that you could be forgiven, so that the weight of your sin no longer holds over you. And then in verse um, 8 of chapter 3, we see that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Satan has been active in creation from Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve are in the garden, and God says, don't participate in eating from this tree. That would be sin. Don't do that. And Satan comes in wanting already to ruin God's work, saying, no, 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 no. You should, you should do your own thing. Forget honoring and obeying God. Just take that fruit and eat it for yourself. And that is what Satan does. He comes into God's created people, and he's always trying to pull us towards wickedness, towards evil, towards open rebellion against God. And then Jesus shows up. And John wants us to know, Jesus was made known to us, was revealed on earth for this purpose, that Satan's hold over us is destroyed. Jesus went to the cross, he dies, he rises again, and then in rising again, he sends the Holy Spirit, and suddenly the power of God comes to God's children so that the, our old inclination to always go into sin, no matter what, is not always what we do anymore. Suddenly Satan's pull on us to always drag us into sin doesn't have the same pull, and we can be made new because of what God is doing in us through Jesus, through the Holy Spirit. What Jesus' work set us free from that and began a new thing in us. And then Jesus set in motion God's great plans on earth to uh, build up the body of Christ and prepare for a time when Jesus would return. And then we read in Revelation that eventually Jesus would encounter Satan and then in this great battle, Satan is overthrown, thrown into the lake of fire. Evil, wickedness, gone. All because Jesus came and began God's work. So as God reveals this, we as God's children say, praise God. Look what he's done and how he's worked to make things known to us. And then we, we see the, the capstone of, of this section of how God reveals things to us. In chapter 3, verse 1, when we read this, see what great love the Father has lavished on us? Look what God has revealed in Jesus. See the love that you find in that, that we should be called children of God. Now it's love given to us for the purpose of making it so we could be children of God. All the things Jesus did broke the bounds of sin that were on us, and then God looks at us and says, come in, you're my adopted kids. Now, in Greek, this verse does some really interesting things. Uh, we start our verse in the NIV, chapter 3, verse 1, and we say, see what great love. In Greek, that word see is like a staccato point. It's an emphasis to say, behold, look, look here. I'm holding this up, God's great love, behold. And then the next word in Greek is an idiom. An idiom is a phrase that we wouldn't use at all now, so they don't translate those because we would read it and we'd be like, that's weird, who, says, who talks like that? But in, the idiom in this is, from what country is this love? John is asking that question. Behold, from what place is love like this? Who's ever seen love like this? That's the love of God. The child of God encounters it, and we say, man, we didn't have any right to be loved like that. Behold how God loves us so. From what country or what place would have a love like that that God would send his own son to die and as a sacrifice for us, to draw us in as children? How he loves us so. Now, that, especially that verse in, in um, chapter 3, that verse propels our faith forward. We may try to live out our Christian faith from guilt, saying, oh, I, I don't know if I'm good enough, I need to work harder. 
or just habitual, I just do these things because I feel like I have to, um, maybe even trying to earn God's love, and those things don't work. Our faith and our Christian walk moves forward when we're compelled forward by the love that God has for us and has shown us in Jesus. We're people that wake in the morning and we say, how he loves me so, I can't wait to follow him now. It's not for my own guilt or me trying to earn it. I just want to follow him because he has done so much to love me. Now, this love leads us out into a life where we continually practice righteousness. Um, We'll go to the next slide, and it's the only other slide, but there's something else that John is doing in this passage. He keeps talking back and forth about people who do things. Now, we think about somebody who practices law. It means that they do it. That's their career. They go out and they keep doing that over and over, get better and better at it. In this passage, he's using that verb, if you do or make. Those who do righteousness or make righteousness and continue to do that, they are following God as we need to be. Those who do or make sin or continue in sin, they are not following God as we need to be. And I'm going to use the word practice there, just this idea of those who go out and just keep practicing sin are erring from what they need to be as children of God. Those who continue to practice righteousness, live this out, do it, they are in the bounds of what God intended for his children. Now, there's some things that John wants to teach us. In uh, chapter 2, verse 29, he says these words, Because he, the one who saves us and loves us so, is righteous, then we are born of him, and everyone who does what is right is born of him. In other words, John is saying, because God is righteous and he's loved us so, then we also are called to be righteous. We're swept up by God into a brand new thing. God has made it possible for us to live as new creations, not tied to the old patterns of sin that we always fall into. And so in that, we look at the love God has given us and we say, ooh, God is righteous. Since I'm being made new by God, I want to be like him. So I'm going to be righteous. I want that to come out of my life, to be the fruit of my actions. And then in um, verse three, or chapter 3, verse 9, uh, John says this really interesting phrase. It says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. The way that we could look at that is to say, it's like God is in you planting seeds that have produced a new plant, a new thing in you, and it's growing in you so that it's going to take over. You used to be sinful, and now God has planted a new thing in you that's growing, and it's his life, the life that Jesus would have us live that's growing in us. We become more and more like Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And John says, that's how you live in righteousness. In verse 7 of chapter 3, he says this, uh, the one who does what is right is righteous. In other words, he's saying, you can't just say, I'm righteous. You have to do what is right. As a Christian, we can't just say, "Mm, good enough, I'm righteous. No, we have to walk the walk. We have to live these things out. When we speak, are the words coming out of our mouths righteous words, pure words, or are they words that tear people down or are crass or lead to false thoughts that don't honor God? When we're with our families, what kind of people are we? Are we righteous people who are honoring God and how we treat others? When we're at work, are we righteous people at work with integrity and loving and merciful and and trying to witness to what God is doing. When we're alone, are we righteous or are we falling into sin patterns? What comes out? Are we being creative and using our space to glorify God with our time? John also throws out another interesting tidbit about living righteously. Um, Go with me to uh, verse 
um, three of chap uh, actually yeah verse three of chapter three and he says this all who have this hope in Jesus purify themselves just as he is pure what is that hope well in the previous verse he had talked about Jesus is going to come back and all who have that hope in Jesus' return, tap themselves into the power of God to say, Jesus will come back. So that's going to fuel me into righteousness. I want to be ready for this moment when Jesus returns. I, I often think it's no coincidence that Jesus said at the Last Supper, do this, take communion in remembrance of me. Because remembering is a massive part of our Christian walk. You could forget almost every day that you are moved forward by the Holy Spirit seeking righteousness, and you could fall into old patterns over and over. You could spend an entire day and not even think about the fact that Jesus will return and that you ought to live as a child of God. But the children of God remember, and we actively remember all the time, what am I aiming for? Oh, yeah, that Jesus will return, and that I need to be ready for that moment and live righteously. So in some ways, we could say we need to practice. Somebody who aimed to get into the Super Bowl has spent probably decades, maybe 20 years or more, practicing all the time, lifting weights, getting ready for that big moment. Our big moment as Christians is when we're face-to-face -face with Jesus. And John would say, do righteousness. Practice that out in your life so that when you meet Jesus, you fit with where he's at and that you would say, Jesus, you're righteous. I sought to be like you and you connect in that moment and not have this huge disconnect of a life of sin and then Jesus saying, whoa, we missed each other a little bit here during your life. How come sin is so prevalent? So we have to be people that practice righteousness, ready for that time we meet Jesus, loving God, loving others through our whole life. If we look at our own lives, we could say, wow, what areas do I lapse a lot? Where do I need to grow in righteousness? How can I do that? Now, God is a God who reveals. He compels us forward by what he's revealed in Jesus because of his love for us. And so we want to practice righteousness, and we also do not want to practice sin. John tells us in 3, 4 that Practicing sin is also practicing a sort of lawlessness. We may think of somebody that we've encountered in our lives that would look at governmental laws and just say, you eh, know, whatever, I don't know, they're there, but I don't need to live by those. Well, that's the attitude of sin. God's rules are here. We have to be obedient, but I don't, I don't want to live by that. I'm going to do my own thing and maybe check into God later. And it doesn't work like that. Those who practice sin have this open attitude of defiance towards God. I, I don't need to follow you. The child of God is not that. In fact, a lot of the apostles would even go as far as to say, now I'm a slave to Jesus. Because of the great love I saw by what God revealed in Jesus, I'll do anything for him. I'll go to any length to follow him, no matter what even calling themselves slaves. So the children of God have no fear of that. I'm a slave of Jesus, bound to do what his will is in my life, not my own desires. And then John hits us with several whammo thoughts that if sin is continuing in your life, my life, in some way, and you're letting it dance around there without addressing it and handling it, then he would say this, those openly living in rebellion to God, practicing sin. They've not seen God. He says this, uh, they have not known God in 3.6. In 3.8, he says those practicing sin are of the devil. Um, and then he also says in 3.10, they're not from God. And he's hitting it so hard, not to say Christians have to be perfect. He knows we won't be. He said that earlier in this book. But he's, he's saying sin is serious. Treat it seriously. Don't dance around with it or try to keep it in your life just thinking, I'll deal with it later. Don't excuse sin. Jesus had that one phrase where he says, uh, you know, if your arm or your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. 
I'm speaking exaggerated, not to cut off your arm, but just to say, if there's something in your life that is dabbling in sin or some behavior, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Make a move to get away from that and run from it as far as you can. Um, And you think of our lives, there are maybe times where we're trying to justify or excuse some behavior. Chances are it's probably sin, and we have to handle that. Um, Now, in the body of Christ, we have some opportunities. You know, we have a lot of deep and good friendships here, and deep and good friendships in the body of Christ call each other out gently and humbly to say, hey, I think I'm seeing some practice of sin here. Can we work together? Can I hold you accountable? We're a people that hold each other accountable. We don't do so harshly knowing that we ourselves are sinners. We've all been saved, but we want to refine each other, lift each other up into a walk with God. If there's Christians, um, we want to do that, but if there's people who are not Christians, then we don't want to come at them harshly either because we want to come at people who are openly practicing sin with mercy and pity to say, look at the love I found in Jesus. I want this for that person too. I long for them to be able to experience the grace and the mercy I found too. Sometimes as Christians we may set up our walls and say, I don't want anything to do with that group of people or they're sinful. And I think Jesus would teach us, no, go to them. Reach out to them. Show them the mercy that you've had and teach them about a God who calls them into something brand new. And then we come full circle. Um, Jesus has been revealed to us. God is making things known, as we talked about before. But there's more that God will reveal. Uh, Jesus will again be revealed. We look to chapter 228, um, and John says this. So when he appears, he's just assuming it. He knows it. Jesus is coming back. When it happens, this is what's going to happen. He says this, we can have confidence. We don't have to be afraid of this. If if in our Christian walk we're thinking, oh, Jesus is coming back. I don't know if he's going to take me. I don't know uh, what this is going to be like. No, 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 no. Be bold and confident in that. Someday I'll see Jesus. He's going to come back. And this is great. This is everything we've been aiming for, that we could be with our Lord and Savior. Think of Adam and Eve in the garden. They sin, and then some of their next reactions, put on clothes, they're ashamed, hide from God. That's what sin does. But in Christ, we are forgiven, and so when we encounter Jesus, we boldly go out and we say, now I'm home. Yes, God is back. He's brought Jesus a second time. In the news lately, we've had a lot about nuclear warfare again, and the Christian knows we don't have to fear that. That doesn't have to take over our world as a thing of like everything's falling apart because we know something greater is happening on earth, that God will send Jesus again, that even if we die, we're going to Jesus. These other things which are terrifying, they're in the world. But we have a greater thing that will happen and that will sweep us in. Now, John also says this, chapter 3, verse 10. He says, this is how we know how it will be made known who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. When Jesus returns, we'll know. We will be able to see the differences there. And a lot of it comes down to what are you practicing? What's the fruit of your life? Is it a continual fall into sin or a continual practicing of righteousness, living for God? And then John says this also, you know, the one who's loving their brother and sister, that's who's going to be a child of God. Uh, I know a lot of us have probably watched the news yesterday in Virginia where we see a lot of hatred. And we look at uh, places around the world where there's a lot of hatred towards people, where people are looking at other people thinking we're better than them or we're more superior throughout the history of the world. But the Christian says, who are my brothers and sisters? How do I love them? I'm not better than others. How can I lift up others around me and build them up in the name of God? And then John uh, closes with this. He says, we are children of God. Um, 
but what we will be will be revealed when Jesus returns. It's kind of an interesting thing to say, but um, he goes on to say, when Jesus is revealed at the end, second coming, we're going to be like him. But we don't know quite yet what that's going to be like because we haven't seen Jesus as he is at the second coming. John's trying to paint this picture. When Jesus comes back, we'll be swept up into a whole new thing, eternity with God. And what will be there, we don't quite have a full picture of that yet. What we will be in that place is like Jesus. So we're waiting to see Jesus to say, oh, that's what he's like. Now we're going to be like him. But John is sharing that to just go bring us back to the love of God. Think about our status in the world. We're created, we've sinned, we've rebelled against our creator. We really don't have a place to be able to say, God, you you should love me. We have no right to say that. But God is showing us, not only do I love you, I've saved you, I'm going to drag you into eternity so that we can spend forever with each other. And then, just as Jesus will be lifted up and glorified, I'm going to lift up my children and glorify them too and pull you into what I'm doing in Jesus. Things that we have no place to be saying, well, I deserve that. So our whole lives look at this and we just say, whoa, God, you love me so much that you would want this for my life and and give me this. Uh, What a gifted gift-giving God who looks at us and draws us in to things that we had no place to ever be because he loves us so. Behold, from what country, from what place is that kind of love? That's the love of our God. God reveals the love that he has. It compels us into a life of righteousness where we're ready and we're waiting for Jesus to return or maybe we'll go to Jesus first And that will be the moment where everything that we've been living for is finally brought to the moment we want, being with Jesus for eternity. Will you pray with me? Lord, we 